Hello, hello, welcome to Light Study Library. This is your host, Lai Yosh. In this channel, you'll be able to learn about these interesting and highly educational information on science and psychology, as I talk about it using multiple scientific and scholarly studies. If you're interested, please enjoy the video and don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this content. Okay, this video will be about the mechanism on how people remember information. Many people, including myself, are far too familiar with the frustrating occurrence of not being able to remember what we learned or studied. Whenever I started working on this podcast, I thought I would be able to just jot down the basic themes of the episode and do sort of an improv of the remaining details. I soon realized that that was impossible for me to do, or it'll definitely take me an enormous amount of time to master, so I decided to just write a script for each video, which definitely takes a lot of time, so it's a bitter experience for me. And you might have guessed right that I rejoiced when I read about the study that was posted on Nature, talking about the mechanisms of why some people can remember information very well while others take more time to do the same. According to the study, science is now able to very accurately detect what kind of things an individual can remember fairly well, and what kind of things they'll most likely have trouble with. By collecting 80 fairly young participants who age ranged from 18 to 26 years old, so definitely young and healthy, a study was done at Stanford University on 2020. The samples were tasked to perform an episodic memory encoding and retrieval task, where they recalled details from a certain environment they were in before, and also retrieved info from a video clip as they reported how much details of the film they had remembered. While they were doing all this, the sample's neural activity was monitored by the use of EEG, or electroencephalogram. The reason why this was done was stated in the study as increases in alpha power in the back of your skull has been related to attention lapses, mind wandering, distractibility, and so forth. The EEG specifically searched for an emission of a brain wave called the posterior alpha power which is related to attention lapses or mind wandering or distractibility, a measure of how much you can pay attention and how durable that attention is to distractions. And the study also looked at the changes in the pupil diameter while performing the tasks and how much of that was related with mind wandering, a state where you're basically thinking about other stuff that's not related to the current task. And the researchers looked at how the changes in the pupil diameter while performing the tasks also related with the slower reaction time due to a decreased level of your cognitive ability. Okay, uh, let me quickly diverge into what this mind wandering is all about, because this state isn't necessarily as bad as it sounds. Mind wandering is actually very useful when you're trying to become creative. There are many studies that prove the effects of you becoming more creative by intentionally losing focus. This can be seen in the stereotypical depiction of an artist or a musician or um, an inventor doing something completely unrelated from their main careers in order to let their mind wander off so that it can produce new ideas. I'll specifically talk about the concept of mind wandering in a future video along with to what extent you can effectively use this technique, because obviously too much of this can lead to an unfocused mind. Okay, back to today's video. So yes, mind wandering is an actual scientific technique you can use to gain benefits, but as of trying to intentionally pay attention to materials and remember them, it's obviously not very useful. And so, the experiment continued with the research and took a survey of the frequency of people being unfocused in their lives. It asked questions like, how frequent do you lose focus both in daily life and during important times when attention is needed? And also, one of the interesting questions that was asked was, how frequent do you multitask? And the collected data showed that the more frequently you multitask with activities that require paying attention, the smaller your pupil size got. This is a problem because, like I said before, a decrease in pupil size when doing attention demanding tasks means that you're actually not focusing as much as you should. Another thing the study had found was that if you lose focus while encoding the information, you'll have a higher chance of forgetting what you remembered. The process of remembering includes the acquisition part, where you input the information, and then the retrieval part, where you remember the stored info. This means that if you failed to input the info during the encoding part of your remembering because you weren't focused, you won't be able to pull out the info because it wasn't stored properly. And this will almost always happen when you multitask, or at least if that 
other activity divides your attention enough that it disables you from remembering the intended info. So, regarding you remembering info for work or for school, the reason that some succeed while others fail depends on how much and how frequently your mind wanders due to multitasking. At this point, there's a question that remains which concerns the alternative method called task switching. Instead of, uh, let's say, rehearsing a song lyric and driving at the same time, what if you repeatedly switch between tasks by focusing on driving while the car is in motion, and every time you stop for a red light, you focus on remembering the lyrics? How would you perform at that? Unfortunately, it appears that this does not produce an effective result either. I'll talk about the reason behind this in the next video, so be prepared for that. Additionally, this study also sort of points out that people who regularly multitask might be experiencing a regular neural underperformance. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? The definition of any kind of multitasking, even trivial things like walking around a busy city with traffic and simultaneously thinking about your crush. You're pretty much dividing your attention to two different things, which leads to your brain not performing at its best with either of the tasks. The more places in life you do this, the more often your neural activity is at a low power mode. And being in this distracted state of mind while you're crossing the road, the more chance of you feeling sorry for yourself. But despite all that, the researchers emphasize that this is all correlational findings, meaning that multitasking between different medias won't always lead to attention or memory reduction. Even so, attention control is important when you want to remember and learn stuff, so I'd say you should stay with focusing on one thing at a time, at least when you're studying for stuff. Okay, that was it for today's video, I hope you enjoyed listening to it. For the video recommendation, you can always watch the past few videos that talks about a scientifically proven technique you can use to focus on your task better. And also, if you want to know more about the mechanism of the focus state itself, then I recommend you watch What is Flow? Finding your ideal environment to concentrate and perform. You might have heard the word flow, and this video talks science on what it's all about. If you're interested, go watch. And also, a book I recommend you read that's related to today's topic is, uh, one of them will be single tasking. Get More Done One Thing at a Time by Deva Zak. I've already talked about this book in many of my past videos, so today I'll introduce a different book called Moonwalking with Einstein, The Art and Science of Remembering Everything by Joshua Furr. I guess some people wouldn't call this a science science book because the author Joshua Furr is a science journalist and not a legitimate scientist, but I think his claims in the book are very much based on scientific evidence and also applicable in our daily lives. Although the book itself is a bit old, the content of it is about the life of Joshua Furr, who is pretty much a mental athlete who got interested and studied the topic of how the human mind memorizes information and began implementing the techniques and the knowledge that he gained throughout his research, and then eventually decided to test his knowledge, figuratively and literally, at the United States Memory Championship, and won. I must say that this is a really good read, even simply for leisure, but I think it'll give good insights to those who want to train their memory and be able to remember more things. The main claims written here are that memory is not an inherited status you are born with, but is a trainable feature, and there are techniques you can use to remember things like numbers, people's faces or names, specific information. Okay, I'm starting to sound like a self-help person, but yeah, this book was really interesting as a read, and it was also very educational. You can check the book out from the link in the description, but I'm going to start working on my YouTube shorts where I can also talk mainly about the books I've been recommending in the past, so I'll talk specifically about the summary of the book there. That's it for the video, thank you for watching until the end. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to Life Study Library if you found it interesting and if you learned something from it. This was your host, Lai Yosh, and I'll see you in another video. Lai Yosh away!